minister to us nonstop. So would you please welcome our family, John and Susan Donnelly from Scotland. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I thought no one was here at that time. DNA. <laughs> you see, I told you you wouldn't forget that. DNA, do not alter. So important in this world that we live in today, which is trying to alter so many different things. But what God has made, do not alter. Amen. Amen. It's a joy and a privilege for us to be with all of you here today. I was going to say y'all. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you make a fool of us when we say we things, then, you know, yeah. That's what family does. You know, we're here to have fun. We're in the presence of the, of the Lord. We're in the presence of our Father. And he just loves when his sons and daughters are at one in the Holy Spirit. There's a beautiful unity that should be there. It should be there, but sometimes we bring it in ourselves. Well, we need to leave ourselves outside the building uh, and come in with that purity of heart and with that devotion to, to God. The worship, super blessed by the worship this Amen. morning. Amen. Super blessed. Um, when we were singing the song, The Blessing, um, that came out during the, you know, that weird year of 2020. Remember that weird year that came? Um, and churches all over the world were posting their church singing the blessing. Yeah, you would have seen it on Facebook, YouTube, whatever. Churches all over the world. But today when we were singing it, it really struck me that did you realize that you were in agreement with everything that you were singing? Because that's what happens when we say amen. Amen is saying, let it be. So all of those truths that we were singing about, let it be. Let it be to our families and our children and their children and their children. And let us believe that God is before us and behind us and beside us and around us and within us. Let us believe these things. Amen. Anyway, I'm not here to preach today. My husband's actually bringing the word. <laughs> You're doing a good job. But, but I do have a little nugget, and this is just for Brenda Rogers, because <laughs> Brenda <laughs> Rogers always says that she loves Susan's nuggets, Amen. which is very sweet. <laughs> but I do have a little nugget, and it comes from John chapter 15, which is all about the vine and the branches. So let me just read from verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Mm -hmm. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Amen. While every branch that does bear fruit, he trims so that it can be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Amen. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain, remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, here's a nugget. Because Christ is in you, you will never be apart from him. Because you are a part of him. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. That's a nugget for Brenda and for anyone else who wants it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thanks, Jesus. Here you go. Praise the Lord. It is a joy to be here. Hallelujah. Stephen, it's uh, on my watch, it's quarter to six in the evening <laughs> because that's the time back home. Is there a clock back there? Ah, perfect. Now I see it. I'm getting dazzled here. I hope you're not getting dazzled by the reflection. <laughs> Hallelujah. Andrew Womack always encourages me. He always says, you know, John, God didn't make too many perfect heads. He says, he only made one or two perfect heads, the rest he covered with hair. <laughs> so I can see you looking around the room, I'm in good company. Marcus has always become, almost, almost becoming one of us, hallelujah. But it is a joy to be here and we do thank your pastors. And if you belong to this church, then you have no better pastors. They truly are selfless. They truly are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. They see things in you that you perhaps don't even yet see yourself. And believe you me, we have known them now for a few years and they will be doing everything with the help of the Holy Ghost to bring out all the stuff that's inside of you for the benefit of the body. So if you don't have a local church, and we're not persuading you to come to this church, but if, if from another church, we would never do that. But if you don't have any church connections, well, why not consider this very place? Man, if we lived here, we would certainly be here getting alongside these two and supporting them because yeah. they have... Paul said to the church in Corinth, he said, though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you have few fathers. Right. And you know, if Paul was to walk through the church doors today globally, you know what Paul would say? Though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you have few fathers. In 2,000 years, we've never really changed that much. Fathers in the church are as rare as hen's teeth. Yeah. And that needs to change. Amen. And I praise God that this church here is blessed with fathers. And ladies, don't disqualify yourself from that. I'm not talking about a gender-related thing here. Amen. A woman can be a father in the faith. Right. So let's not go down this road that the world's going down right now. It's pervert, perverted enough without the church joining in. But anyway, I want to start today with a verse that I started with on the very first time I ministered at the conference, because I only got as far as this first verse, <laughs> and then the Holy Ghost took me off on a totally different tangent. So I want to return to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, and this is as far as we got. Uh, at the conference. So let's, let's open this up a wee bit more because, you know, it says in, in Romans that I long to see you that we may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. And that's our desire and that's our passion. You know, we leave here today but the Word of God stays with you. And I pray that what we share with you today will resonate, will we'll just be recognized in your spirit that uh, God is speaking to you. It's not a couple from Scotland. See beyond, hear beyond the accent and hear the Holy Spirit speaking. And I pray that this accent is not a deterrent, that you're not having to whisper to one another, what did he say, what did he say? <laughs> I'm trusting the Holy Ghost that he will open up the scriptures to us, hallelujah. Amen. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is that light, that lamp to our path. We thank you for the illumination that the Holy Spirit brings. And Father, we pray that even as we look at familiar scriptures today, your Holy Ghost would bring fresh revelation, deeper understanding. So Lord, we thank you for the word, your word, to your people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stephen, it's 11.50. Where do I go to? It's 10 to 12. Half an hour? Okay, thank you. If there's any ministers rising up in here, always ask your host how long you've got. Don't take that for granted how long you've got. Don't you be long-winded and be a blowbag. <laughs> Just respect the authority that you're under right now. I'm respecting the authority. They are the pastors of this church. 
So I just needed to ask, hallelujah. Anyway, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Let's get into the word. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You know, when I meditate on that one verse, I'm overwhelmed by how big my God is. I remember as a wee boy back home in Scotland, I was maybe three, four years old, and my mommy and my daddy took me to a place called Blantyre, and Blantyre is just south of Glasgow. And in Blantyre at that time was a small community, a small woolen community, a mill, and in this mill were a man called Mr. and Mrs. Livingston. And Mr. and Mrs. Livingston gave birth to a son called David. David Livingston. Maybe some of you know David Livingston. He was a famous Scots missionary. Scotland was known many years ago as of two titles. One, the land of the missionaries, because we sent out countless of missionaries all around the world. And two, it was also known as the land of the book. The book. <laughs> the land of the book. And the book was the Bible. Now we were known as the land of the missionaries and sadly here we are hundreds of years later and Scotland now needs missionaries to come to the land of the missionaries. So far have we fallen away. But you know what? The tide is turning. The tide is coming back in over the shores of Scotland. And I believe that we will again become a leading light as a nation for God and for his kingdom. Hallelujah. I truly believe that, that we will rise again from the ashes. The fire's never gone out. It's just diminished a little. But my mommy and daddy took me to the house of David Livingston. It's now a mo memorial. It's now a museum. And David Livingston went to Africa, and he pretty much, the Africa that you know today, the, the Africa that you look on the map today, he charted that. He charted that. To this day, the... the the African nations, the people will refer to David Livingston as one of their fathers. There's statues galore all over of David Livingston, a wee boy from Scotland. And the story goes back home that there are two Sunday school teachers talking to one another. And they said, so how many children gave their life to Jesus this year? Just the one, said one teacher to the other. Just the one? We had 21 last year gave their life to Jesus. Only one? Who gave their life to Jesus this year? Oh, that wee boy Livingston. David Livingston. Well, David Livingston grew up, went to Africa, charted all of Africa. But my mommy and daddy that day, when they took me to David Livingston's museum, bought me a Ladybird book. I don't know if you have them here, but Ladybird books are like first readers. You know, so you have the big print on one side, the cat sat on the mat learning to read. And on the other side, there are pictures of David Livingston and his exploits in Africa. Now, I have to admit, at that age, I had no idea about God. I had no idea. I just loved the pictures of David Livingston fighting with lions and all of these things. I loved the adventure that he was on. So that was my attraction to the book. And my mommy used to always tell me that I carried that book everywhere. Wherever I went, that book came along with me. I loved that book. So here we are now, fast forwarding. David Livingston's gone to Africa. And according to the historical records in that museum, the only uh, recorded conversion of all of his years in Africa was one person brought to Christ. Now, he was one man, one wee boy brought to Christ. His whole time in Africa only recorded one salvation for all his years in Africa. But the one recorded salvation was the chief of all the tribes of Africa. Imagine the impact that chief has on all of the tribes. Now, we were blessed just very recently to be in South Africa in January and we were blessed to go around the schools in South Africa so that was in Durban, Johannesburg, Cape Town and Heidelberg 
the Caris Bible Colleges, where we ministered at the open days. And I'll tell you, God is doing something phenomenal, not just in South Africa, but in the continent of Africa. A nation, a continent, once held so corruptly and so perversely and so wrongly in the bondage of slavery, is now being set free in and through the name of Jesus. And I truly believe that that continent, once so despised by the world, will be the continent that all the nations will look to. They will look to the continent of Africa to say, how do you do this? They will become our example. They're such a humble people, a humble nation, a humble continent. And I truly believe that God is going to do something miraculous in our day through that continent of Africa. But, and I truly believe it's people like David Livingston, a missionary to that land, a, people, a person like Mary, Mary Slessor, another Scots woman who went to Africa, who had a huge impact on that land. God's word will not return to him void. It will accomplish that for which it's sent. So I got my first ladybook reader, first reader, big pictures, big words, carried this book everywhere. So fast forward, I'm now saved, I'm now, fast forward decades, I'm now saved, I'm now a born again believer. I'm moving on with the things of God and I was in construction for 43 years. We used to build a lot of new homes and stuff, anything you wanted we could build you it. And uh, we would travel all over to do that. And one day, one time we were working up at Susan's sister who lived in Glasgow. And because we were putting an add-on, an extension onto her property, her house is upside down because the builders are in. So there was nowhere for the builders to stay because it was too far to commute from my hometown of Dumfries up to Glasgow. To, to commute daily was too far. So I said to Susan's sister, you know, I know you can't put us up. So don't worry about that. I've, I know a local friend, a local pastor in Glasgow itself. I'll speak to him. So Pastor Alex said to us, yeah, sure, you can use my office. He said, sleep in the office. He said, but there's only one thing. He said, there's only one city in the office and there's two of you. I said, that's okay. We'll sort that out. Well, it didn't take much sorting out that night because as soon as we walked in through the door, my friend saw the city. He threw his bag on it and he said, that's mine. So I'm left. When I'm walking on this carpet, man, I'm bouncing, yeah. right? So, but in his, his office was a, a hard concrete floor. So he's got the settee, I've got the hard concrete floor. So I made my bed up with blankets and some cushions. And I started to snuggle down. But before snuggling down, I just randomly grabbed the book. Who knows you don't just randomly grab a book? You know, the Holy Spirit leads your hand. You don't know who's doing that. But the Holy Spirit led my hand that night to a book on Scots explorers. Scots, not explorers, adventure stroke missionaries. And I just happened to open up the book. Who knows you just don't happen to open up the book. And as I happened to open up the book, the pages just fell open to a man called David Livingston. And I lay down with my head on my pillow, my back on the hard concrete floor, and I just opened the page and I was laid down and the Lord said to me, stop. And I just knew the headed was David Livingston. That was all I read. He said, when you were three years old and your parents gave you that book, it was then that I deposited into your life that one day you would go to the nations to share my love. Yeah. I didn't even know Jesus. Didn't even know Jesus, didn't even know God, but yet here he is, before I formed you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You see, this, this just isn't relevant to Jeremiah. You need to see yourself right now that this is God speaking about you. If God can put a seed into the heart of a wee three-year-old boy, he can do that for you, even before you were born. You know, some of you think you're an accident. You heard me sharing that during this week's conference. Some of you think you're an accident. You're not. Some of you think you're a mistake. You're not. Right. Long before your mum and dad even thought about coming together to have intercourse. Sorry to talk so graphically, but it's church. <laughs> long before they even thought of coming together in union. Long before they even thought of having you. 
about starting a family, God knew you. Amen. Well, two amens. Yeah. Sadly, they were in the front row. <laughs> God knew you. I don't want any post-mortem amens. You've got to keep in tune. God knew you. Brothers and sisters, he knew you. That's how intimate he is with you. Some of you here maybe didn't even know your mum or your dad. But God knew you. You were never an orphan. You were never abandoned. You were never a mistake. You were never... For, you were never an afterthought. I had to work through that. You know, in my family, we're short of imagination, Darren. My dad was John. I'm John. Guess what my son's name is? John. But here's the thing. Years later, I mean, there, there's 10 years, when my older brother, Brian, he's, he's, he's passed away. Brian's, but there was 11 years between me and Brian. There was 10 years between me and my sister Joyce. 10 years in, here I am, came along. But it was a long time later that I learned that I had a brother in between me and my sister. A long time later. And he died as a child, he died as an infant. And one day, praise God, I'll get to see my brother that I've never seen. But here's the thing. Guess what his name was? John. John. His name was John. The struggles that this John went through were unbelievable. Huh, so I was just an afterthought. So I'm just a replacement. I'm just a substitute. You just named me after the boy that you lost. All this junk that the devil throws and accuses you and makes you think wrong about who you are. But then God took me to the scripture. Before I formed you in the womb, John, I knew you. Before you were born, John, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, John. Put your name in there. Put your name in there. God's no respecter of persons. What he's doing for me, he'll do for you and more. Hallelujah. God is so big. Before you came out of your mother's womb, he had already chosen you. Now you and me might not have chosen him. It was 31 years later that I chose him. But he had already chosen me. Amen. I was a bit slow. I was slow to catch up. 31 years behind. But praise God, aren't you, aren't you not glad for God's patience and, gracious and, and graciousness and long-suffering towards us? See, the beautiful thing that this reality is not only for Jeremiah, it's the same for you. Romans 8.29 puts it like this. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Let me say that again. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Underline that word. If you're reading the NIV, which I'm quoting from today, and I'm jumping from the NIV to the New King James. For those God foreknew. Underline that word foreknew if you're reading from the NIV right now. Because that word foreknew has more than just knowing about someone. The deeper meaning to this word for you is having special interest in. Wow. Wow. I'm sorry that right now you're not getting excited. I'm sorry that right now you're not swinging from the chandeliers. I'm sorry that right now I'm not scraping you from the ceiling because I'll tell you what, you should be dancing on the ceiling right now. That God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, creator of the universe, and in spite of everything that he has made, he took a special interest in you. Amen. Oh, well, there's two or three waking up over here. <laughs> Hallelujah. He did. He's taken a special interest. In, here's the deal. Look, listen. Forgive me. Forgive me when I get excited. No, 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 no. 
<laughs> forgive me when I get excited, and I'll forgive you when you don't get excited. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has a special interest in you. He's got a great plan for your life, according to the scriptures. Before you were born, he set you apart for a special and unique work. And there's a special calling on your life to be his witness. A unique work. Unique. You're unique. We explained that during the conference this week, so we're not going there today. But you are unique. You have a unique DNA. What does that mean? Love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, hope is where really I want to go. Hope can sometimes be found in the most unusual places. Yes. Hope can be found in the most unusual environments. Hope can be birthed in the most severe circumstances. Let me just quote one, two, three, four scriptures for you. And I'm going to come back with a question to you all, y'all. <laughs> And I want you to tell me the word that jumps out to you as I share these scriptures. Psalm 119 verse 74 says, For I have put my hope in your words. Psalm 130 verse 7 says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Psalm 42 verse 5 says, Put your hope in God. And Psalm 147, 11 says, The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Amen. What word jumped out? <laughs> Good students. Good students. Maybe I should have said, Stephen, what word jumped out for you? So we're all saying hope. Well, you've just burst my sermon. <laughs> For I have put my hope in your word. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. 42.5, put your hope in God. And those, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The fanatics have got it right. The word is hope. Because I can then say, for I have put my hope in your word. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in God. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. It's really interesting that Psalm 42, 5, as well as Psalm 130, verse 7, in fact, them all, but let me pick on Psalm 42, verse 5. It says, put your hope in God. And I want to ask you a question today. Where's your hope? Where have you put your hope? If the psalmist is telling us to put our hope in God, that means we can put it somewhere else. Where have you put yours? Is your hope in yourself? Then you'll fail. Is your hope in your husband or your wife? Then you'll fail. But if your hope is in God... I can guarantee you 100% success. Put your hope in God. Hope can be birthed in hopelessness. It can be birthed in misery. It can be birthed in defeat. Who remembers Shekinah? <laughs> Who's Shekinah? Who can I pick on? Somebody put their hand up. The guy, okay, everybody tells me he's the guy in the book of Ezra, but what about this guy in the book of Ezra? Stand up, please. I want to embarrass you, yeah. Stand up, I want to embarrass you. I'm teasing. Oh, okay, let's, oh, if you're already embarrassed, let's stand up. Who is this guy in Ezra? Go for it, sweetheart. Go for it. Good girl. Good girl. Marcus, I want to know if you listen to my messages. <laughs> Who's shaking Aya? He's a guy in the book of Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> and he's <laughs> Can I come back to my sweet sister? Can you remember what the name Shekinah means? Okay, sweetheart. Does anybody remember? Lady at the back. Mary Lee, on you go. 
Yahweh has taken up residence. Ezra, you're, you're absolutely 100% correct. 100, you're top student, okay? You're the student of the day. Marcus is quite close behind you, but he's always behind, but that's okay. <laughs> he's a bringer of hope. Ezra was down in the dust, sackcloth and ashes. And Shechaniah came along and said, in spite of all of this mess, mayhem, sin, all of that stuff, in spite of all of this badness, there is still hope. Amen. Listen, regardless of our messes, regardless of our mayhems, regardless of our sin, regardless of our badness, listen, 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 there's still hope for you. Amen. There's still hope because the God, this Shechaniah, which translated from Hebrew into English means Yahweh has taken up residence. As a new covenant believer, Yahweh now lives on the inside of you. You are never without hope. So whatever hopeless situation you appear to find yourself in, hope is right there with you. I remember one day sitting in the living room of our home, and I've got, now Susan, I've got my music, I've got my music blaring, blasting, and I think it's Casting Crowns that sing this song. I like Casting Crowns. And I'm singing along to Casting Crowns. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel for you. And I'm singing it. I'm giving it, we call it in Scotland, I'm giving it big licks. I'm giving it big licks. I'm giving this from the top of my voice. I'm shouting it from the rooftops. My wee wife comes walking through. She listened half-heartedly and she said, that song's rubbish. I went, what do you mean that song's rubbish? I said, Susan, it's a song of hope. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. She says, John, there's not only light at the end of the tunnel, there's light in the tunnel. Yeah. I went, wow, wow. I went, Susan, that song's rubbish. <laughs> Casting crowns, if you're listening, your songs are not rubbish. I love your stuff. Hallelujah. But you know, she was waking me up to the reality that even in the darkest of days, even in the darkest of moment, the light of Christ lives within us. Amen. Jesus himself said that you, not only him, you are the light of the world. So we have the, possi we have the, the possibility, the opportunity, we have the wherewithal to shine bright even through our darkest days. Yes. Two yeses and one amen. We're getting better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue. Not just an instructed tongue. The sovereign Lord has given you a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Everybody needs a Shekinah in their life. Everybody needs somebody to come along and, and say, come on, in spite of all of this, in spite of what we're seeing, in spite of what we're feeling right now, there's hope. There's hope. Sometimes you just need Jesus with skin on. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you just need a brother or a sister in the Lord just to come alongside you. There are many encouragers in this room right now. But let me tell you this, every encourager needs to be encouraged. I, remember, I played a lot of soccer, still do play soccer. But in my younger days, when I played at a good, good level, good competitive level, I was, I was the team captain. I was always known as an encourager. And I remember John, if your name's John, some, some, a lot of Johns in Scotland get called Jock. So a lot of my friends would call me Jock. To me, that's a strange name now because I've never been Jock for over 31 years, but that's okay. But my old friends still call me that. And I remember one day when I'm playing soccer and it was a game we had to win to get any chance of promotion up to the top league. It was a game we had to win. And it was nil-nil with about 15 minutes to go. And I heard the, sh the cry from the coach, Jock, Jock, get them going, get them going, stir them up, get them going. Come on, 10 more minutes, get them going. Now the whole team was playing bad that day. I'm having a bad game personally. But none of us played well. It was nil-nil with 10 minutes to go. And he's shouting, get them going. My first thought was, who's going to encourage me? <laughs> Who's going to encourage me so I can encourage them? And young in my faith as I was at that point, the Lord said to me, whisper to me on the football field, in the soccer field, he said, I am your encouragement. Yeah. And man, that was enough. Amen. And I am proud to say that the game finished nil-nil and we didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he lifted me. He lifted me. Yeah. He, he gets you going. 
even when you don't have a pastor around, when you don't have a brother in the Lord around, a sister in the Lord, he's your encouragement. Amen. The light's not only at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> it's in the tunnel. <laughs> I know you say that I elaborate on that story, but it, but it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's <laughs> she always says, I didn't say it was rubbish. Well, that's what I heard that day. <laughs> but why have you been given an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary? There's a lot of weary people. Listen, there's a lot of weary people in the body of Christ. We pastored for almost 18 years. Been in the church for over 30 years, serving in that same place. And I remember, you know, I used to read the scriptures and hear the scriptures being taught, how God binds up the brokenhearted, etc., etc. And I used to think the brokenhearted were all out there, outside the church walls. They're here. They're in this room right now. Can you remember the story when Jesus... Come here, sweetheart. Me? Yeah, please. I want, you, I want you to stand just about here. Are you going to hit me? <laughs> Do I need to brace myself? Not, not, too, not too hard. In fact, stand about here. Come away from the, the pulpit. Yeah, you stand about there. That's perfect. Just you, don't move. Stay there. Remember the story when Jesus is called to go to the house of uh, Jairus. Jairus, as you call him. He gets the call to go to the house of Jairus. Now, when you read that story, you'll note that he didn't go straight away. He hung around for a wee bit. But then he eventually started to go to the house of Jairus. And guess what happened on his way to the ministry appointment, which is that music stand over there. That's where Jairus' house is, right there. Guess what happened on the way from leaving this time? He then started to walk to the house of Jairus where he met a woman with an issue of blood. He then took time to minister to this woman. And this woman was eventually freed from that thing which held her for over 12 years. He then proceeds, stay there. He then proceeds to the house of Jairus where the ministry appointment was. This is where it was all going to happen. This is where he'd been called to go. And you see most Christian ministers today, sadly today, they're over here doing their stuff, doing their ministry. Go to the house of Jairus. Oh, there's a big ministry appointment waiting for you. Young dead girl's dying, if not yet dead. And you're going to bring her back to life. Wow, says the new church Christian minister of today, 2,000 years after the life and times of Jesus. He goes running to the house of Jairus. Sees this woman, shoves her out of the way. <laughs> to get to the house of Jairus because this is where the ministry appointment is. Believe me, that happens in Christendom. Ministers get so focused on where their ministry is that they didn't even realize there was a woman with an issue. I wonder how many people you've walked by today even coming to this very place that you couldn't even acknowledge them or smile or do anything. You just went on by them to get to the appointed place. Well, let me tell you, there are people with issues of blood in your life, in your workplace, in your work environments, in your neighborhoods, in your streets, in your leisure times. There are people with issues of blood all around you, and Jesus took time to spend with this woman. Amen. Just as a by the way, do you know when this, do you know when this woman with the issue of blood, do you know when her, her healing came? When she reached out. When she reached out, when she touched the hem of his garment. You're right, but you're wrong. <laughs> you are right, you're correct. But that's not when the miracle happened. If you read the story earlier on, you'll see when she heard about Jesus, mm -hmm. she went. Mm, that's good. The miracle happened when she first heard about Jesus, not when she broke through to touch the hem of his garment. It's when she first heard, that's when the miracle that's began to happen. That's, yeah. So please, 
I'm beseeching you, church. There are people in your sphere of influence that have got issues of blood. And God is expecting you, yes, you, to minister to this person with the issue of blood. And it's not just women, there are men that are broken and are hurting. God is expecting his church. We're his hands, we're his feet. God is expecting his church to stop and take time and quit hurrying to get to that ministry appointment. We came specifically for the conference in Oklahoma. Now I know that we're going on to Colorado, but that's, that's next week. I've got stuff to discharge this week. We need to open up the, thank you. We need to open up the, Peter tells us to open up the bowels of compassion. Well, let me tell you this, and I'm sorry to offend anybody if I say this, and I'm, it's disgusting. But let me tell you this, if he's telling us to open up the bowels of compassion, let me tell you this, there's a lot of constipated Christians. <laughs> they're so, man, they, they, they're so offended. Well, I'm not going to help her. You know what she did to me? And they go on and they go on and they're so, everything is, they're so crossed, they're keeping it all in, they will not open up the bowels of compassion. They're, everything's crossed over, their fingers are crossed over, their legs are crossed over, their butt cheeks are banged together. <laughs> they, they walk around like this. They're keeping it all in. They will not open up the bowels of compassion and yet God is beseeching us, he's begging, he's pleading with us. Open up the bowels of compassion. The grace, the mercies, the loves, the healing power of God, it's all locked up in an institution called the church. Amen. And we need to release it. So if you're constipated, I'm not saying in the name of Jesus, be loosed and go. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you know, church, we need to be compassionate. Yes. Many years ago, we went through a tough time in church. Some elders were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. They were saying things they shouldn't have been saying. It caused a lot of problems. And I won't go into all of that. Eventually, we gave the elders a, a, a choice. You can either stand before the church and repent or leave. So they chose the latter. They decided to leave. I won't go into all of that either. This is the point I want to make from that story. I was now then, back then, playing football, soccer on a Friday evening. So we're getting all ready, we're out on the pitch just warming up. And a guy, an elder, former elder, that caused us the problem and the grief, came along to the game that night, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. So that Darren, can I bother you? Sure. Come up onto the platform, brother. Lord. So, so the, <laughs> imagine Darren's my elder. So my elder came up to me and he was shocked to see me. He was just guilt ridden, condemned. Not by me, I wasn't condemning him at all. We, we just loved him all the way through this. But he came walking towards me and he put out his right hand for a handshake. And I looked at him right in the eye and I pushed his hand away. I went, I don't want your hand. He then began to look at the ground. He says, oh, Johnny, I can understand why you're feeling like that, why you're saying these things. I can understand where you're coming from. He said, no, I don't want your hand. I want a hug. <laughs> and I hugged this guy, and I hugged this guy, and he was hating every minute of that hug. <laughs> and he was trying to get out of this hug. And the more he wrestled, and the more, <laughs> the more, the more, the more he wrestled, and the more he tried to escape from my grip, I just hung on all the tighter, hallelujah. <laughs> and I loved him and I said, brother, enjoy your game. Yes. And we walked away. Thanks, Darren. Can you give me a kiss? <laughs> hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> he received grace. Amen. He received mercy. I could go into great detail as to what they'd done. They did not deserve that. Did we deserve what we got? Who am I to hold anything against anybody? If a man hanging from a tree, unrecognizable by this time, 
almost breathing his last breath, if he can turn around and say, Father, forgive them, who am I? Who are you? Let's get over ourselves, huh? Let's forgive them. I'm not saying that I can be friends. I'm not friends with that guy. But I can love him. I can love him with the love of Jesus. And I, I, we do. We do that. Did he deserve it? Not one bit. He took around 50 feet people away from our church. Doesn't matter. When I see where we are now, years later, how the church is going from strength to strength, and how it's a united body, it's almost like it was worth it. Almost like it was worth it. Anyway. That's why we've been given an instructed tongue so we can have that word of encouragement to sustain the weary. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.27, as you know, says that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Hope can be birthed in poverty and debt. Remember the story of the widow woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 with the widow's oil. A remarkable story. And yet in the midst of that, not just poverty and extreme pressures of life they were coming to take her boys away her boys were going to be the ransom for the debt sadly that her husband had left are you listening husbands and yet she went to the prophet she went to the man of God and I find it really interesting that in that story in 2 Kings chapter 4 I find it really interesting that the prophet said what do you have in your house and she typically answered the same way that we all answer thousands of years later. She said, nothing except. Nothing except a little oil. The prophet didn't say, what do you not have in your house? He said, what do you have in your house? And you might not feel as though you've got much, but if you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Amen. You've got something to give out of your storehouse. So you... Thankfully, what happened here in this story, and we don't have time to look at it today, but what happened here was, what ran out? In that story, what ran out? Was it the jars or was it the oil? The jars ran out. There was no more jars to fill. So what does that show you? That shows me that earth's supply ran out, but heaven's didn't. Amen. If there had been more jars to fill, God would have kept filling them. God would have kept filling them. God would have kept filling them. You're the jar. Yes, amen. You're the jar. Susan's got a wonderful teaching. She'll teach you one day, I'm sure, to you all. But she said she talks about the Samaritan woman who went with her jar to fill at the well. And she encounters Jesus. She meets Jesus, and of course, he tells her her whole story. But I find it really interesting that when she returned to her city, she left her jar at the well. Why? Because as Susan rightly points out, she was the jar. Amen. She was the jar. And Jesus was the waters of life being poured into her life. You know, yesterday I touched on, I think it was yesterday at the conference, I said that sometimes Jesus needs to get the church out of the way. Yeah. Let me elaborate a wee bit more on that because I'm aware that I did leave you dangling on a hook and didn't really fully explain that uh, to its fullness, wholeness. One day... I was in a coffee shop with a brother in the Lord, comes to my church. Okay, it's no longer my church, but you know what I mean. I am no longer the pastor. Yeah, I was the pastor then, because eight weeks ago we handed the church over. And uh, anyways, I was in a coffee shop in my hometown, sitting having a good conversation. He knows me well, been with us a long time. I first met this man in a drug rehab and he's just going on strong. That's years ago now. When I see him now, he's just going from strength to strength. All that junk is behind him and he's, he's doing well. Anyways, a lady came almost walking by us and she's smiling sweetly. She's coming towards me and she says, good morning. And I'm thinking, who are you? Who are you? I recognize your face. So she walked on by and she sat down at her table, but then she came back for some nice and forks and cutlery and stuff. She's coming back sweetly smiling again. And she's saying, so are you doing good, John? I'm thinking, man, she even knows my name. <laughs> and who are you? So I'm saying, Holy Spirit, who is this woman? What's her name? Who is this woman? How do I know this woman? And I looked at her and I went, 
Barbara. I said, now I've got you. Your name's Barbara. She said, yes, didn't you recognize me? I went, no. I said, I've not seen you for about six, seven years at least. I said, the last time I saw you, you had long, straggly blonde hair. I said, now it's jet black. I said, and it's cut short, it's bobbed. That's what you call it, ladies. Yeah, it's bobbed. Is that a bob cut? Yeah. yeah. I don't know these things. <laughs> you understand why. <laughs> I said, now it's jet black and it's bobbed. I said, you're looking amazing. You look totally different. I said, and your countenance. I says, your countenance is so bright. Your eyes are sparkling. I says, you're looking fantastic. Oh, thank you, she said. And then, she, and then I said, and Barbara, you, you've, you're, you're so different. You're, you're, you're looking, you've lost a lot of, uh, you're looking so much. Uh, I said, you look so much, you look so different. I said, you're so much, you've lost a lot of, uh, and I'm trying to find the right word and put it right. I said, back in those days, I says, you were a lot, uh, and she went, fatter? I went, yes. I said, you were so much fatter back in those days. <laughs> Guys, you've got to be careful how you speak to ladies. Just, just remember. I said, you were so much heavier, so much fatter back in those days. I says, but now, I says, look at you. I says, you look fantastic. She says, oh, thank you, John. She says, she says I put it all down to my crystals and my meditation. Oh. <laughs> Told you, William. <laughs> Did you hear that? Oh, that went through the room. Did you hear it? You know what that is? It's a judgmental attitude. It's a judgmental attitude. Jesus never once judged that woman. He only told her the truth. A judgmental attitude. Now, let's rewind a wee bit. Where are the 12 mighty men of God at this time in this story? Where are the 12 disciples? Well, according to the scriptures, the 12 mighty men of God are in her hometown at Walmart. <laughs> They're buying some groceries. Yes. They're buying some provision. So they now come carrying their bags of shopping. I mean, you read the story, you'll see it. Carrying the bags of shopping, they all of a sudden they see a Samaritan woman talking with their Jesus, a Jew. Now, the Samaritan and Jew rivalry was horrendous. You know, if I'm a Jew walking through Samaria, I've got a Samaritan following me behind me with lumps of straw in his hand, with a stone to ignite and to burn the straw in every footstep that I leave as if I was never there in the first place. But yet here is a Jew talking to a Samaritan, a Samaritan talking to a Jew. The church comes back, carrying the bags of shopping. Scripture says they didn't say it, but they thought, what's she want from him? What's he doing talking to her? What's that coming from the church 2,000 years ago? The same as what came from the church two minutes ago, a judgmental attitude. That's, good. That's, good. That's why Jesus has to get the church out of the way. When I say get the church out of the way, I mean not you physically because he needs you. You are his hands, his feet. What he needs is your biases out of the way, your prejudices out of the way, your judgmental thoughts out of the way. Why? Because if they had been there, they would have put a wall between Jesus and that woman and Jesus would never have been able to reach that woman because of the judgmental attitudes of the church. Amen. It needs to be kicked out of here and not just here, globally. It has no place in the church. Jesus, I love what... Uh, Marcus, my dear brother, said to me, I know I tease, I know I poke fun, but I really love this man. I'm really enjoying getting to know him so much better and this sweet lady beside him. This is a joy, so thank you. But we were having a conversation about this very story just the other night. I think it was me and you. I'm convinced it was me and you. <laughs> because Jesus only ever spoke about this woman's husbands. You're right, you've had five husbands. And the man that you're now staying with, isn't that right, Marcus? Yep. And the man that you're now staying with is your sixth man. 
But as Marcus and I were bouncing back and forth the other night, oh, he came out with a nugget. So it's all, I'm giving him, for one time only, giving him that this is where I sourced this from and got this from. He said, yes. And the seventh man came in and transformed her life. The seventh man. Interesting that it's number seven, but that's a whole different story again. The seventh man changed her life. Now, before we move on, for our last five or so. Let's remember where these men have been. And as far as we can see, these 12 mighty men of God, and I'm looking at mighty men of God right now, these 12 mighty men of God, as far as we can see, the economy was boosted by a few bags of shopping. (laughs) One woman. You listening, men? One woman, one lady went back to that same city and told that same city all about Jesus. And a whole city came out to meet the seventh man, to meet Jesus. And a whole city, we know from scripture, was transformed by the love, by the grace, by the mercy of God. One woman's testimony. Well, I'm looking at more than one woman in here. And I'm certainly looking at a whole lot more one man. Why not your testimony? Will you be bold to just speak and love the truth? Now, to get back into the local coffee shop. So we're now fast forward in 2,000 years. We're now sitting in Dumfries Town Centre in the Costa Coffee Shop. I said to that lady, you see that? There was a judgment went right through. When this lady said, I put it all down to my crystals and meditation, I went, I looked at her right now and I went, praise God. I said, it's working. My friend, I'm his pastor, thinks I've lost the plot. (laughs) He thinks I'm in agreement with New Age movement and medicines and all of these things. He thinks pastors lost it. He's agreeing with crystals and meditation. But here's the thing. If I said it's not working, I'm a liar. I saw that woman seven years ago. She was a wreck. She was a mess. She was suicidal. She was going through relational marriage problems. She was forgiven up on life. And now I'm seeing a a woman totally transformed. I said, it's working. My friend thinks I've lost it. I said, Barbara, I said, I can't disagree that it's not working. But here's the thing. I said, when the storms of life come again, and I says, they will. I says, it says in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have trouble. Jesus himself said that. I said, when the storms of life come again, it says, which they will, what you've got will not sustain you, will not keep you, will not help protect or save you. I said, I've got something right now in my back pocket that can give you hope for eternity. Well, what's that? She said, so I brought out my New Testament. Now I would, I shared the love of God with her. And her eyes started to fill with tears. And I would love to tell you that in that coffee shop in Dumfries, she gave her life to Jesus. She didn't. But a seed was sown. A seed was sown. And where one scatters, another reaps. And I'm convinced that that seed, even to this day, I've never seen that woman again. But I'm convinced that that seed to that day is growing. And when she gets into difficulty, guess what she's going to do? She's going to say, oh God, help me. She's not going to go to a crystal. She's not going to go into get into her chance. She's going to simply pray, oh God, help me. That's a word to sustain the weary. And that's what's been deposited in me and you. Hope can be born in the prison. Acts chapter 16, 16 through 40. If you're taking notes, we don't have time to look at it. But all, as you know, Paul and Silas, Silas were in prison. All the prison doors were opened. Every chain was loosed. Salvation came to the jailer and his family. And all of that happened because two men decided to praise God. Not just to pray to God. Most of us would certainly pray to God. We would pray, Lord, this is unjust. These are trumped up charges. We shouldn't even be in here. Lord, this is not right. Get us out of here. That would have been our prayer. But Paul and Silas decided to do more than pray. They thought they were going to praise the name of Jesus regardless of their circumstances and their surroundings. Now here's another thing as well. I want you to imagine that there they are in locks and stocks and chains and fetters and they're, 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 they're bound. 
But the visitation of the angel came, the earthquake came, and all of a sudden the doors were flung open. Now they could have chose to have still sat there. And as you sit there, it still looks like you're a prisoner. You're still wrapped in chains. But when you get up, the chains fall off. And as you start to walk, the chains clink, 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 fall to the ground. Some of you need to get up. Let me, uh, let me tell you a wee story. I, had, I used to have a pet budgerigar. Do you know what budgerigars are? They're small like parakeet. Yeah, budgies. Small budgies. Yeah, small budgies. And his name was Peter. Peter was a male budgie. If you want to get a, a, a small budgie that talks, then buy the male. They're the ones with the blue beak. The females have got the brown beaks. Buy the boys with the blue beaks because they're the best talkers. I know that's not normal in humanity, <laughs> but the, the, the boy birds are the best talkers in, in bird world. Bird world. So I had this wee bird saying loads of things. I would say, Peter's a bonny boy. Cup of tea for Peter. Gives a wee kiss. He would say, up the Queen's Queen of the South is my local soccer team. They're the only team mentioned in the Bible. The Queen of the South shall rise again. <laughs> so we are still waiting 2,000 years later for the Queen of the South to rise again. But anyways, that's another whole story. But anyway, Peter, I don't know, he had the wrong call in his life. He should never have been born a budgie. He was the world's worst flyer. Two things about him. One, I would open up the cage door and he would just sit in his cage. He would just chip away. Quite happy in the cage. So I would open up the cage door so he could come around the living room and fly around and get some exercise. Do what he was born to do. Fly around the room. He would never come out. Just sit in his cage, chirping away. So I would put my hand in the cage, bring him out and throw him up towards the living room ceiling and he would do half a lap around the living room and then go on the floor and he would walk everywhere. He would walk. I'm thinking, you were born to fly and you're walking? He would just chirp away, quite happy, playing on the carpet. How many Christians are like that? The prison doors are open. And we're still sitting in captivity. Deuteronomy 1 verse 6, God said to Israel, rise, break camp, go from this place. He said, how long will you stay at this mountain? How long will you stay at the mountain? You know, some mountains, listen to me and listen carefully, some mountains will not depart into the sea. Wow. See, that's going down really well. <laughs> Why do you think God gave you the feet of the deer? To climb a mountain. Why do you think he's given you the wings of the eagle? To soar above the difficulties in the mountains of life. Sometimes you just need to get your sleeves rolled up, your hiking boots on, and get climbing. I love, we love to do hiking, trekking. We love that. There's no better feeling when you get to the top of the mountain to see the panorama, to see the view. Where's the mountain? Under my feet. I've conquered it. I've climbed it. Got to the top. So God's encouraging you to get out of those caves, get out of those cages, get out of behind those bars of where an enemy has tried to keep you for far too long. Hallelujah. Almost there, Stephen. Let's just scroll down all of this. Hallelujah. Are you getting something from this, church? Amen. Amen. Let me close with a precious, precious man that you'll find in Luke chapter 2. I know that you will all know this man, but this is a story, and I'm just going to end here, all about Simeon. Simeon, it says in Luke 2, 25, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do to him for what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, 
As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and be and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Verse 36, there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and, there was a, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them at that very moment she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Simeon reminds me of sometimes when you have to go to an airport and maybe meet and greet family or friends or visitors that are coming to see you and you're sitting waiting and the doors slide open. Ah, oh, is this them? Ah, oh, not them yet. Slide open. Ah, oh, here they come. Ah, oh. Simeon was like that. Every day he was in the temple, waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of God, watching a mother and father bring in their newborn. Is this the one? Ah, oh, not yet. This one, this is the one. Ah, oh, not yet. He lived with the expectation. He had been promised by God. You've been promised by God. Don't run after the promise. Just walk with the promise giver. Yes, keep a hold of the promises. Don't let the promise become God. God's God, not the promise. That's right. But eventually the day came where two people and a small boy came in. And something from within, something that his eyes would never see, rose up. And spirit to spirit, the Lord said, this is the one. This is the one, but this is beautiful. Look what, he, look what he said. It says in verse 26, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Look at verse 28. Simeon took him in his arms. He's now holding the Savior of the world. He's holding the Messiah in his arms. Here's the thing, many of you have been promised things of God. He was promised that he would see. He not only saw, he took hold of. Have you taken hold of the things that God has spoken to you? Or are you just seeing them from afar? God is asking you to take hold. Can you remember, I think it was here on the Thursday night before the conference started. Can I ask you all to stand, please? This is where we're at.